So I think I'm sitting in Toronto right now, and I think uh-huh. we're Waterloo right now. And I know we're both in the same country right now, and we're in the same planet right now. But where are we planetarily speaking right now? Yeah. So well, so we're orbiting the sun, right? So so our our the Earth is is orbiting the sun. It gets around once a year, um, and then our sun is orbiting the center of the galaxy. And so the sun is moving at about 220 kilometers a second. Uh, in the direction of the constellation of Cygnus, if you ever were interested in that, um, so you know, going around uh, around the galaxy, and so the, we're orbiting the sun. The sun's yes. orbiting what? The sun is orbiting the center of the galaxy. So the, the galaxy. The galaxy. The what's at the center galaxy. of the galaxy? Nothing. What's at the center there? Well, uh, a lot of stuff. So, so the Milky Way galaxy is a kind of disc-shaped uh, uh, collection of stars and gas and dust and black holes and and you know all, all kinds of things like that. And um, so if you if you've seen a uh, if you imagine a galaxy in your head, you probably imagine like a spiral galaxy with, you know, spiral arms. So our galaxy looks a lot like that. It's got a kind of bulge of stars in the center and then it's flatter um, around the edges. It's sort of disc shaped. And in the center, in the bulge, there's a whole lot of stars. There's clusters of stars. There's just a lot of um, a lot of star formation and stuff happening there. There's a lot of gas and dust and there's a supermassive black hole. Um, It's about uh, a four million times as massive as the sun. We call it Sagittarius A star. So the star part is the, uh, it's part of the name. It's not actually a star, but it's Sagittarius A star. That's the, the name for it. Um, and uh, we've we recently obtained some really cool imagery of Sagittarius A star, the Event Horizon Telescope project. Uh, I produced, saw it and uh, I saw your geek, yeah. amazing geek out video on YouTube about it. <laughs> I well, yeah yeah well so there've been two there so the event horizon telescope produced images of two black holes Sagittarius A star is the more, is our black hole and that image came out more recently the first black hole picture they got was of a, a, a supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87 um, which is which is a, a very massive uh, galaxy kind of more distant so anyway um, that's that's where we are and the other thing that's important to know about where we are is that the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a big disc-shaped galaxy, um, you know, kind of uh, relatively nearby as galaxies are concerned, we are moving toward each other. Uh, so the Andromeda Galaxy is moving toward us at 110 kilometers a second from our perspective, and we're going to merge in about four billion years. So <laughs> that's where we are in the universe. I read about that in your wonderful book. So we are orbiting the sun. The sun and our solar system is orbiting the center of our galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy. Yes. This galaxy, is it orbiting something? No, but it's, well, it, it's part of the local group of galaxies, which is the creative name for the group of galaxies nearby. So it's the Andromeda galaxy, Triangulum, the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, so we're in this little group of galaxies. So we're kind of gravitationally bound, but we're not in like steady orbits. We are moving toward Andromeda. Andromeda is moving toward us. Uh, we're going to, when we get close, we'll probably loop around a little bit before colliding. Um, and the Triangulum Galaxy is going to do the same thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're not we're not in orbit on that scale exactly. We're just kind of moving around. Okay, I got so many more questions, but okay. I want to I use them as a lever to talk to me about them. Through the discussion of your first book, which I believe is a book that you read as a child yes. growing up in California, it is yeah. called A Brief History of Time. I'm yes. going to describe it for our listeners so that they can picture holding it in a bookstore. Sure. And I'm going to ask you to tell us about your relationship with it. A Brief History of Time, From the Big Bang to Black Holes by Stephen Hawking was published in 1988 by Bantam Dell Publishing. I am holding the navy blue hardcover in my hand with a glossy jacket, Stephen Hawking sitting in his wheelchair with a, I don't want to say glum, but like a, a flat, like this is how it is kind of expression on his face with a bunch of stars behind them. At the bottom, it says, with an introduction by Carl Sagan. Book came out in 1988, sold 25 million copies. With a was a Sunday Times bestseller for 237 straight weeks. Stephen Hawking was an English theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and author, best known for research surrounding relativity, quantum mechanics, and black holes. Born 1942 in Oxford, died 2018 in Cambridge. He was the professor of mathematics and later the director of research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology at the University of Cambridge. Stephen Hawking, for those that don't know, also suffered from a motor neuron disease called ALS that gradually paralyzed him, including his speech. In A Brief History of Time, he talks about the structure, origin, development, and eventual fate of the universe. Dewey Decimal Heads, file this one under 523.1 for natural sciences slash astronomy slash astrophysics slash 
universe. Katie, please tell us about your relationship with A Brief History of Time. Yeah, so um, when I was when I was a kid, I was really curious about all kinds of things, right? And I was I was the kind of kid who was like always sort of taking things apart and putting them back together. I was always trying to understand how everything worked. And at some point, you know, I kind of I I saw things like I I got interested in like science fiction. Um, you know, those children's magazines that they that they children's science magazines where sometimes they talk about like the big bang or planets or black holes or whatever. And so I guess it, it must have been just a year or two after it came out, I, I found a brief history of time. And, um, and I, I remember reading that book and, and at the time, you know, I was maybe 10 years old or something. I, uh, I didn't understand everything in the book, you know, it was, it was, uh, it's, it's still not, you know, it, it's a it's a very popular book. Um, it's not the most accessible book, I think, in terms of like it's it's elegant, but it's I not. I showed it to a friend yesterday. Easy. He said, "Ah, oh, the book everyone owns and no one has read." Yeah, yeah. You so, know, but but the introduction, the first couple of chapters are very accessible. Yeah, yeah. So, but it gets into some deep stuff, and so I remember that when I read it, I didn't understand everything in it, but I understood that this book is about you know the Big Bang, about the biggest questions in the universe, about black holes, about time, and when I, you know, am looking through the book, you know, it talks about the the author is described as a cosmologist, right? Um, and a cosmologist is someone who studies the cosmos. And I was like, well, clearly this is what I want to be. I want to be a cosmologist. I want to study the universe and how it works. Um, and that was just, that was the most fascinating thing to me. The thing I, I could, I, I imagined like this would be the best way to spend my life is just thinking about these big questions, trying to understand the universe. Um, so I, I wanted Stephen Hawking's job <laughs> as well, soon as well, I read well, that well, book. Well, I, I, you said you were a curious kid, but yeah. what about that job or the contemplation of the cosmos for the rest of your life was so appealing? Um, I just like, it was, it's the biggest questions, right? It's, it's the most fundamental questions in the universe. Like the, the question of where we came from, of how the universe works. Why is it here? How are how does you know how does it all fit together? Where are we going? Um, what's going to happen to us? Uh, you know, all of those big big questions were things that I just found utterly fascinating, and um, it just it was an extension of my curiosity about everything. You know, I wanted to know how the TV remote control worked. I wanted to know how the bike gears worked. I wanted to know how black holes worked. <laughs> and just like I I had this this curiosity about everything, and I liked the idea of you know, of spending my time just thinking really hard about hard things, right? Like I liked mm. math, you know, I, I liked, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't like a, a math prodigy or anything, but I, I liked thinking about uh, things that are logical and where you can solve a puzzle, you know? And, and so uh, cosmology was uh, sort of the biggest puzzle and, and you solve it by, by learning these, these, uh, you know, rules about the universe and, and logically fitting everything together um, in a way that makes sense. That that kind of thinking, that kind of working really appealed to me. So this book is called A Brief History of Time. Mm -hmm. Time. I want to pause on that word time. Page 16 sure. of your book, you write, everything you see is in the past as far as you're concerned. If you look up at the moon, you're seeing a little over a second ago. The sun is more than eight minutes in the past and the stars you see in the night sky are in the deep past. I've even heard you go into uh, detail about how two people in a room together are actually mm -hmm. at occurring in their minds at different times. So yeah. how do you define time? <laughs> uh, so if you are, if you're a physicist, then time is one part of the coordinate system that you're using to sort of think about how things are happening in the universe, right? So, so you have three, three directions of space, right? You have sort of front, back, left, right, up, down, um, and then you have time, which you can think of as another dimension, as another dimension where on this sort of grid uh, on on which things happen. So like if I said that, you know, if I said that, that um, I don't know, uh, a balloon pops, right? I can tell you where that happened and I can tell you when that happened. And that, that's, there's, there's, there's sort of four coordinates, right? There's X, Y, Z, and T, right? And so X, Y, Z are telling you the spatial part of that coordinate system and then T is telling you the time. So that was an event that happened at a particular space at a particular time, right? Um, so generally in physics, we think of time as 
one part of that coordinate system that we use when we're talking about how things occur in the universe. It gets complicated because how you move through space affects how you move through time. And that's, that's all part of relativity. So if you're moving very, very quickly, then uh, your experience of time is going to be different from someone who's moving slowly. If you're very close to a large gravitating object like a black hole, your experience of time is different from somebody who is not near a large gravitating object. And so we all kind of move through space and time in different ways. And so in the same way that, you know, if you're, you're, you, ha you trace a path through the world as you move through your life, you also trace a path through space-time, through this, this sort of grid of space and time as you move through your life. And the way you're moving through the time part of that is dependent on how you're moving through the space part of that. They're connected to each other. And so we are all tracing our own world lines. They're called world lines, these paths through space-time. And sometimes those world lines meet when you have an event where you, you know, go and shake hands with someone, you're at the same place at the same time. And sometimes they don't meet, you know, sometimes you're, um, you pass by a, a street corner, somebody else passed by through, you know, 10 minutes before. And so you're at the same place, but not at the same time. Sometimes you're, you know, you're 50 meters apart across away from someone else. You're at the same time, but not at the same place. Like, so there's, it's, I think of time as being part of this sort of coordinate system of this space time fabric essentially and that fabric is malleable which is the weird thing about relativity is that that the space and time can bend in different ways uh depending on what you're doing and what's what's there yeah i'm trying to put my finger on that einstein quote that you may know and i don't about like the pretty girl and the oven burner Have i don't know that, that? One. Oh, okay he is that okay well i won't i won't try to do it but he's like you know because i was the reason i wanted to use that quote is because it's like why do our perceptions of time change all the time? Mm. Like, what? How come, you know, uh, a, a minute can feel like an hour in certain situations, well, and an hour can feel like a minute in others? How come? I mean, I that's up psychology. Like, hey, that's psychology, though. That's 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 human experience. That's based on how our brains process uh, information and how we emotionally react to information uh, in different circumstances. And some of that is because you know when you know, we evolved from creatures who needed to uh, think very, very quickly when they're under threat. And, uh, you know, so there, there are different ways that we that we experience time uh, subjectively, just based on our psychology, based on our biology. But but what I'm talking about is, is we experience time differently physically. So if, if you were an astronaut, for example, and you're orbiting the Earth, you're going to experience time slightly differently than someone who's at home, not in a way that you can perceive. So you don't actually it's such a tiny difference. You would not notice it, uh, but it's measurable. I mean, even, I mean, they've done experiments where they take a clock and they put it at the bottom of a tower and they take another clock and they put it at the top of a tower and they leave them there for, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever. And you can tell that they're a little bit off afterward. Really? Like they, yeah. Like the time that, because the time is moving just a little bit slower on the surface of the earth than it is a hundred meters in the air. See, okay. I'm going to throw another thing at you on this okay. time. I want to pause sure. on this time thing because, because we also got this, Gregorian calendar that we came up with 500 years ago and we used it and <laughs> clocked ourselves backwards, you know, to, to a couple thousand years ago, but it's this annual cyclical kind of linear time. And then there's also, I've been reading a lot about the, the sort of more cyclical universal calendar that people have followed for many hundreds of thousands of years, the circle of life type thing and growth and regrowth and so on. How do either of those calendars that we think about, maybe both of them, fit into this concept of time that you're describing um i mean that no, no calendars are really uh are really connected to the physical aspect in so the interesting thing about time in in physics is that while while you can move in any direction you want in the three dimensions of space you can only move in one direction in time now how quickly you move through that through time is dependent on on what you're doing and where you are but the direction you're moving through time is constant. You're only going to move through the, toward the future. You cannot move toward the past uh, physically. So there's no there's no cycle in that sense. Like, uh, you know, we we started the Big Bang and we're going toward the end of time, whatever that turns out to be. Maybe there will be new universes born. I, in my book, I talk about some cyclic universe models where you know our universe ends and a new one comes up after it. That's that's so many trillions and trillions of years in the future. We're we're not. That's not really relevant to human experience. Uh, we make calendars to to mark the passing of time, 
uh, just for our own reasons, because we live on a on a planet that has seasons and days, and and you know these are important things to our our experience, and they're important to our biology. We have internal clocks that that respond to um, to respond to the passage of time. But from a physics perspective, we're just we're moving toward the future. We're just moving at different ra- rates in different ways, but we're all moving toward the future. And the 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 most important clock in in physics is the second law of thermodynamics. So this is the entropy. This is entropy. Yeah. So this is the idea that that disorder increases into the future. So whatever's mm. happening, there's more entropy. Entropy is just disorder essentially. There's more entropy as you go toward the future, and that determines, in, in, in a sense, the direction of of time. Right. So so the future is dis- defined as the direction in which entropy is increasing. And so, and, oh, and that's, you know, the future is the direction that entropy is increasing. Yeah. I mean, there, there are different mm-hmm. ways to, to mm-hmm. define things, but I think the sort of most, most sort of accepted way to think about the, the future versus the past is that the future is the direction in which entropy is increasing. So, right. you know, if you, if you, uh, you know, scramble an egg, um, that's something that increases the entropy in that situation. You had a, a sort of very simple, very orderly egg, and then you scramble it and now it's a mess. Um, you can't really unscramble that egg. I mean, if you if you tried to do that, if you tried to take every little egg molecule and put it back, you know, with very careful tweezers or whatever, and you had to you'd, you'd have to sort of undenature the proteins or whatever, move the move the atoms around. In principle, you could put the egg back together uh, if you were very very careful, but you would expend so much energy in the process. You would get hot and sweaty. You would you know you'd have uh, you would expel. Uh, waste gases into the room and so on, the total entropy in the room you're in is going to be higher at the end, even if you put the egg back together. But what if you eat the egg in any Mm -hmm. form Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes through your body and Mm -hmm. eventually it turns into uh, food that a chicken eats and produces a new egg? I mean, that's that's something that happens. Is the entropy declining? There's always going to be waste in that process. So so there's always going to be some kind of disorder that's that's the result of whatever process is occurring. So this is this comes back to um, people. This come this is relevant to things like a perpetual motion machine. So if you if you try and spin a wheel and keep it spinning forever, it's going to eventually slow down. And the reason is that it's going to lose a little bit of energy to friction. It's going to make some yeah. heat. Like there's going to be some waste heat. Yeah. yeah. So something's going to break. Like it's going to decay a little bit. And so in the end, like it'll be more disordered, there'll be more heat, the the wheel will stop spinning. And it's the same with, you know, you can try and put together some kind of cyclic thing for for life, for food or whatever, but there's always going to be more disorder at the end than there was at the beginning. Got it. I have okay. I I wanna I wanna keep going down these rabbit holes and I wanna keep moving through your books. Um mm-hmm. by the way, there's a quote from Stephen Hawking in in um this book where he mm-hmm. says, if time travel is possible, where are the tourists from the future? Mm. And um, like that gets to the, do you believe in aliens question? <laughs> uh, I, I suppose. Um, I mean, the question of time travel. Fermi paradox, I mean, the idea that oh, if, if the universe is so vast, how come right, we haven't seen right. any other living things yet? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a long conversation. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the question of, of whether or not time travelers would have come back. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. The, physically, it seems that time travel into the past is probably impossible. Uh, there's, you can you can mess around with the equations and set up certain conditions in which technically you can have sort of a world line that bends back on itself. So you can go back to, to your own past if you, if you mess up the equations in a particular way. Um, but it doesn't seem to be actually possible in terms of practical... Uh, so you, know. you can do it mathematically. You can't do it physically. Just the same yeah. way that you say in your book, you can see the Big Bang, but we can't get to it. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's a, I would call that a slightly different thing. But but yeah. I mean, you, so mathematically, in the sense that that if you if you were able to manipulate space and time however you wanted, um, then you could set up a situation where the equations would admit the possibility of a, a cycle, a, a, what we call a closed time like curve. So a, a a world line that meets itself, a, a travel into the past. Um, but uh, in practice, it, 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 it seems to involve things that we don't think exist in the universe and ways of manipulating space and time that we don't think are possible. So 
probably it can't happen, but we don't about, know. For what certain. about your belief in aliens? So the so then the alien thing. So so that's a whole other question because I mean. Yeah, so the Fermi paradox is this question of, you know, why, if there are aliens out there, why haven't they come to visit us? Um, you know, and that's that gets into whether or not you think that that aliens would want to come and visit us, or or if alien life is going to be the kind of technological life that can create spaceships and and you know spread out through the galaxy. And then there's there's a lot of questions around that. Um, well, what about you personally? Well, I think that so my thinking about alien life is. You know, we have a reasonably good idea of how life originated on Earth. I mean, we're not certain, obviously, um, there are some questions, but the the best hypothesis we have is that there are certain chemicals that were present on the early Earth. Those are chemicals that are very common in the in the universe. We've seen traces of these things, amino acids and things on comets and, and other places in the universe. Um, there were chemicals that were present. And there were sources of energy like um, like uh, hydrothermal vents underneath the ocean. And over time, by chance, some chemicals kind of bounced off of each other. Chemical reactions occurred. Uh, there was a source of energy. It, it sort of gradually evolved from chemistry to biology. And the first single-celled organisms appeared through just a very, very long time, <laughs> you know, billions of years of, of sort of random, uh, 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 random sort of collisions of, of molecules. And then that led to biological evolution and then that led to life. So we think that that's probably what happened on Earth. The thing about that, though, is that the conditions that were present on the early Earth are not unique in the universe. You know, we know that there are moons of the gas giants yeah. in our own solar system that, yeah. that seem to have hydrothermal vents underneath their underneath their icy shell of covering their oceans. And and that suggests that, you know, probably they have the right chemicals, the right conditions that life life could arise there. Whether or not it has, we don't know. Maybe it's pretty rare, but there are something like, you know, four billion stars in our galaxy, right? Um, a lot of those probably have planets. We think, you know, somewhere around a planet per star is is somewhere around the average. Some of those planets are probably the kinds of planets that can have these uh, these conditions. So the so idea that we're the- 400 billion? Yeah, somewhere around 400 billion. 400 billion stars just in our galaxy. Just and in our many, Milky Way how many, galaxy. How many galaxies are there? So there's something like two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, as far and as the, we know. So, so the idea that 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 we're the only place in the universe where life has arisen seems seems just shockingly unrealistic to me. I mean, and people will argue about this. You know, I get into arguments about this where people are like, "Well, you know, but you don't know for sure. Like, we don't know how common this stuff is." But that I feel like uh, the hypothesis that we are so special <laughs> that it's only happened here is is such a low probability hypothesis that we might as well reject it. Ah, uh, four billion stars in the galaxy. Um, 400 billion. 400 billion stars in the galaxy. Let's hang out in the galaxy for a second. So we talk about mm. A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, oh. published in 1979 by Pan Books. Cover depicts an outer space with stars and planets scattered around and one with a goofy facial expression, a tongue hanging out of an open mouth and flapping hands. Douglas Adams was born in 1952 in Cambridge, UK. You got to think about Cambridge. Um, died in 2001, very sadly, of a heart attack at age 49. Mm. English author, screenwriter, essayist, humorist, satirist and dramatist probably pronouncing those wrong whose most famous work is hitchhiker's guide which sold over 15 million copies what's it about seconds before the earth is demolished to make way for a galactic freeway arthur dent is plucked off the planet by his friend ford prefect a researcher for the revised edition of the book called the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy who for the last 15 years has been posing as an out-of-work actor file this one under 823.914 for 20th century fiction Katie, tell us about your relationship with The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, so this is a book, I don't remember exactly how old I was when I first read it. I was pretty young. Um, I, I enjoyed science fiction in general, and The Hitchhiker's Guide was sort of the ultimate, uh, the ultimate sort of funny science fiction novel. Um, it was, I loved that I loved that it was so witty. You know, I loved that this book had so many jokes and and you know, really amusing commentary uh, about life and the universe and everything. Like, just it was it was a hilarious book. It was well written. It was it was fun ideas in science fiction. 
Um, and it was, it was just, it was a joy, you know, to read. And, and I, I carried it around with me. Like I would go, I would travel and I would keep it in my suitcase just so oh. I had something great to read if I needed to read something. I, I for, Ooh, for many years. I like was, that. The backup yeah. book. Yeah. It was my backup yeah. book for a very yeah. long time. Um, and it was kind of a, it was just something that was, that was pleasant and, and familiar. Um, you know, I memorized passages of it. I, wow. I got, I just, it, for, to me, it was, it was such a, it was such a joy, you know, it was just playing with ideas about science, playing with language. Um, I really loved that. The um, meaning of life is yeah. 42. Yeah. 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 And just like stuff like that, just absurdist, but, but also, um, also just really fun, you know, really, and really, and sometimes very cutting, uh, in, in its commentary. And I, I really, really enjoyed that. I feel like some of these words you've been describing, uh, absurdist fun, uh, you know, you could describe your own Twitter feed with them today. You've got this joyous, fun, absurdist, sometimes cutting. I've heard you talking about, uh, anti-maskers and so on, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And at Astro Katie, for those that don't follow you, you've got half a million people you're talking to, you're broadcasting to kind mm -hmm. of on a regular basis. Hanging out in the galaxy for a second, you know, there's people on the planet today who believe that we got to we got to be like hitchhikers. We got to mm -hmm. be like Elon Musk. We got to call a nice space. We got to settle on Mars. And yeah, we might put the, the sort of starting seeds of that in place today and it won't happen for generations. What's your opinion on the whole colonizing other planets thing? And because it seems to me part of the sadness mm -hmm. of being a theoretical astrophysicist is that you can't go to all the places you're talking about. What's what? Where do you net out on what Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are doing today? Oh uh, well, okay. So <laughs> that's that's also a long conversation. I feel like um, I first of all, there's there's a lot of discussion in the sort of space community about the term colonization and how that's that's the wrong sort of lens in which to view exploration of space because. You know, obviously, colonization on Earth has uh, a long and and very uh, very yeah, bad history. Negative. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and we don't want to approach space exploration in that way as as sort of you know we're going to go and we're going to conquer flag uh, planters this place. Yeah, yeah. We don't want. That's not the right way to go about this, right? Um, I I like the idea of going out. I wanted and, to say that's fascinating to me because of the fact that there's no life on the, you know. I we don't know. That, we don't know, right? Right, right, right. We don't know for sure. Yeah. There could be microbes on Mars. There could be life on all a lot of other in a lot of other places. In, or forms in the of life we cannot see or even perceive. Yeah, yeah, but but even if it is even if it is entirely lifeless, like it's it's still a natural wonder that that should not be approached with avarice you know Ooh. i i just i i think that that's 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 part of the my problem with with that that sort of approach so your first the first i asked you so what are your thoughts on the subject the first thing you thought was the word the word to describe it is wrong it's not colonizing mm -hmm. plants now so then zoom into the the act yeah. of taking our species off of just yeah here. well i mean so i think that i mean i want to go to mars like I've I've applied to the NASA astronaut program a couple of times. I I made the first cut once. Like I want to go into space. Wow. You know I do I do want to. Don't you think it'll take to too long? There. Take too long? What do you mean? Yeah, to get there and to get back. I mean it'll take a long. Up. I mean it's a long trip to Mars. Like uh, you know six to nine months probably. Um, and that's part of the challenge of it's part of one of the things that hasn't really been solved yet. How do you how do you survive and survive with other people in a small space <laughs> for that length of time right that's that's part of the difficulty but then but sorry to say this but like then why do you want to go so bad because I, I just i i mean i feel like i i want i want to experience that you know i want to experience another world i want to see what it's like i want to feel what it's like there i want to experience the different gravity of another planet the the difference in where the horizon is the the you know um just the feel of being in a in a place like that. I, I mean, difference of where the horizon is. Well, because because the horizon, the distance to the horizon is based on on the curvature of the planet, right? Oh, so no, so it's it closer looks... on the moon or on Mars than it is here. So what looks like the ground and the sky touching would look at a different place there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. might not be noticeable. I don't know. I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want to know yeah. what that looks like. Yeah. Um, 
you know, so so I want to experience. I, I would love to experience. I love the idea of exploring. I mean, I love traveling on Earth. I love going to different places and experiencing different settings. So I, I would love to go. And I think that there's a lot of scientific. Um, there's a lot we can learn scientifically by by going. Scientifically, though, I think that the 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 most efficient way to explore other worlds is through robots and satellites. I think that that you know it's very expensive and very dangerous to send humans. Uh, and a lot can go wrong. And, and once you have a human on a planet, you've contaminated it. So if there was life there, then you've contaminated it. You've you've changed the ecosystem entirely. So there are a lot of reasons why, from a scientific perspective, humans sending humans may not be the right choice, depending on what your goals are. But I think that as humans, we like to explore. We we are excited by new places and new experiences, and we're inspired by that. You know, so many people were inspired by the moon landings, uh, inspired into going into science, and and you know, and and even even just from the perspective of if you go to another place, you have a different perspective on your home, yeah. right? And yeah, that the that happens with. Dot. Yeah, yeah. So right. like, the, yeah, the pale blue dot, or or the images of the Earth from the Apollo missions were. Some would argue that that sort of was one of the things that kind of kickstarted the environmental movement was mm-hmm. people for, for the first time seeing their earth from far away and understanding how fragile and and special our home is. You know, that that's another aspect of, of human spaceflight that I think is is important and valuable. And I was just um, learning I was just learning recently because we interviewed Kevin Kelly for this show. Mm-hmm. And he was the former editor of the Whole Earth Catalog. I was just mm. learning recently that those images were actually not revealed to the public for a long period of time because mm-hmm. they were thought to be fraught. Oh, with, really? With some danger, yeah. If, huh. if you showed everybody where, where we actually are. Yeah. But, but yeah. I, I thought, so I, I see that you're kind of like venturing towards like the net positive side yeah. of, of this whole yeah. thing. But yeah. I was thinking of it from a different perspective, which is that I just watched Don't Look Up, right? Like mm. the yeah. tongue-in-cheek movie about the asteroid coming. Yeah. And there's been endless asteroid hitting Earth kind of stories over time. And I guess part of the fascination we have with that is that we got to get somewhere else, like just in case, forget climate change for a second, just in case the whole planet, you know, were to get struck by something. So how far in advance do we see stuff coming at us? Well, okay. So, so I, I feel like that that's an argument I hear a lot. And I think that that's not a good argument. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. yeah. so, okay. I think, I think exploring the universe is a great idea for a lot of reasons as a way to, have a backup plan for humanity, I think it's a terrible idea. There, There is almost nothing you could do to the Earth. Or there, there's almost nothing the universe could do to the Earth that would make it less habitable than Mars is right right now. Okay, uh, right? Like, yeah. let's say that, let's say a giant asteroid hits the Earth and it's like a nuclear winter. It destroys, uh, you know, it destroys our atmosphere in various ways. We, you know, we can't live on the surface. There's radiation. You can't live on the surface of Mars. There's radiation on Mars. There's there's no you know we don't there's no protective magnetosphere or or atmosphere to to slow down the cosmic rays. Like Mars is a is a really inhospitable place. There's no breathable atmosphere. You can't. I mean, there's a a tiny tiny amount of carbon dioxide and basically nothing else. So you can't breathe on Mars. UV um, ten thousand. Sorry. UV is probably ten thousand. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's it, you you can't live on Mars, you'd be, if you go to Mars, you're living underground in like a lava tunnel or a cave to escape the radiation. Uh, You're, you're bringing your own um, oxygen with you, or you're making it through, um, through uh, with machines that can convert carbon dioxide to oxygen on the earth, on the planet. You're, you're, you're taking, you're trying to extract ice from the, from the soil, but then it's, it's contaminated with these toxic chemicals called perchlorates. It's a great great point. You're saying, Hey, the the worst that could happen here is that we'd be more like that anyway. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So, uh, (laughs) how far, I want to, how far in advance do we see stuff coming at us? Cause when you talked to Ali a few years ago, you said, Hey, in the Southern South of the equator, we got pretty much nothing looking up. Well, I think, so I think that, I think that some of those surveys have restarted since then. Um, we don't see everything. Uh, we have pretty good coverage for the most dangerous stuff. Uh, for for things that can destroy a city, I think we we see most of those things before they can get here. Uh, you know, so it depends. Like, there's a there's an element of luck. Um, if something is coming from the the wrong direction, it might be hard to see. We might miss it with our surveys. Um, so I don't know the exact numbers in terms of how well we're we're watching. 
there are some surveys that are coming up that are going to do much better. So there are some surveys that are going to look specifically for, for near-Earth objects. And then there's also the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is going to be doing some, um, some surveys that can find uh, near-Earth objects. Some of those are going to be made more difficult by the Starlink satellites, because the Starlink satellites uh, are just the kind of thing that make it harder to see uh, to see near Earth objects, and so our our ability to protect ourselves from space rocks is going to be damaged by the Starlink system. I don't that's know exactly that's Elon how Musk's, that, that's Elon that's Musk's, Elon Musk's uh, thing. Uh, yeah. thing to get everybody yeah, faster yeah. internet. Yeah, so I I don't know, you know, if you work out the sort of like net positive or negative <laughs> of yeah. uh, his ventures on the Earth, it's hard to say right now. Yeah. Hey, I, I've been mm -hmm. wondering where to stick this question in, but it's been burning in my head since before we chatted. And so my dad's an astrophysicist. He mm. did masters in astrophysics at the University of New Delhi in 1966. So he jokes cool. that the stuff he learned then is like what you'd learn in like 12th grade today, you know? Um, but also, uh, he also is a deep believer in astrology to the mm -hmm. point where he's had, you know, all of our charts written from when I we see. were kids mm -hmm. and it's the date and location and place of your birth and what the alignment of the stars was then. He talks to people who use little computer programs that say, you know, what's going to happen in the, you know, uh, three month, six month, 12 month window of his life. And he, he, he's an astrophysicist who believes in astrology. Mm -hmm. uh, astrology is a pretty loaded term in our culture today. Where do you net it on astrology? How do people think about navigating that from a very logical place? Well, I'm, I've never heard of another astrophysicist who who puts any stock in it. So that's, okay. that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, um, and I, I shouldn't label my dad. So he was a high school physics teacher in Canada. Okay. That's that okay. was the net up. He I wouldn't. Um, he wasn't at the Perimeter Institute or anything like that, but he he did a degree in mm -hmm. astrophysics back in the '60s in India. Okay. 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 Um. So let's, let's, let's move him down a few pegs to start with. Okay. Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He'd be All fine right. with that. <laughs> so when when I talk about astrology on Twitter, people yell at me um, because uh, because a lot of people view it as a kind of uh, a kind of cultural uh, practice or a religious practice. Um, and you know, I it's not for me to tell people how to think about their spirituality. But I want you to. But that's right. What, well, <laughs> that's so so my 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 thoughts on that are that if it is if it is an aspect of spirituality. You know, I, I don't have much to say about that. Um, there is there is no science to it. There there are a lot of science terms in it. You know, people talk about uh, you know orbits and ephemeris and like all, uh, like all of these charts and everything. And and you can you can plot things out. When astrology was first being done in the world, um, it was being done by people who were taking very detailed observations of the night sky, and a lot of those observations led to actual scientific discoveries. Yeah, but astrology as a as a way of connecting the apparent positions of objects in the night sky to human experience has no science behind it at all. So why and, the why the why the industry? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think that there are a lot of people who have figured out that um, that uh, a large segment of the public does not understand how uh, physics and astronomy work and finds, you know, spiritual connection to the universe. And so there are a lot of people who exploit that, who uh, try to convince people that that there is some, you know, science behind the the positions of the stars and 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 for a lot of people that feels very intuitive some people you know a lot of people think well of course the planets the positions of the planets should connect to how i live my life because you know we're all connected in the universe well, the date and place of my birth is some so, sure like, i feel like there's more stuff coming up now in the science on the side of fatalism mm. versus free will like i feel like i've always been a free will mm. kind of guy and as i listen to more and more sam harris or i listen to more and more you know, these guys, I just saw you roll your eyes. <laughs> I'm hearing a little more on the fatalist side these days from uh -oh. the sciencey people. Are you, uh -oh. are you not hearing this? Am I misreading um, the, I mean, there are, there are interesting discussions to be had about, uh, about how our experiences in our brain, brain chemistry and our, our backgrounds affect how we live our lives. And, and, you know, you can, you can you can dig down deep into that rabbit hole, but in any event, whether or not it looks like Mercury is moving east or west in the sky has nothing to do with it. 
you know, I mean, most people don't even see Mercury, right? Like it's actually kind of hard to observe the planet Mercury um, because it's quite, quite close to the sun. And so, you know, it's not like it's not like you're walking down the street and you look up and you see that Mercury is moving the wrong way and it totally throws you off for the day. That's not that's not how that works. But yeah. And yet you talk about talk to people who are into astrology and they're like, oh, no, Mercury is in retrograde. It's you know, I can't, you know, my whole life is messed up. Right. And that's, that has nothing to it has nothing to do with, you know, the, 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 the positions, the apparent direction that Mercury is moving through the sky just has no effect on anything on earth like it's just it's an optical illusion and why sorry can i say why the eye roll oh about sam harris yeah uh there's there's a there's a group of of uh there's a group of people who are um there's this whole like new atheist movement kind of thing and and a lot of what a lot of what they do and talk about is stuff that i think is unhelpful in the world but i don't want to get into i don't want to get into that <laughs> okay it's interesting though that you brought up atheism though because i was interested that the very last sentence of a brief history of time the very mm -hmm. last sentence of the entire book uh -huh. is um i don't want to just pull open the book so i can mm -hmm. actually read the last sentence i'll just read the last paragraph so that it has some context however if we do discover a complete theory it should in time be understandable in broad principle by everyone not just a few scientists then we shall all philosophers, scientists, and just ordinary people be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we and the universe exist. Mm. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. Mm. I was very surprised that the very last sentence of this whole book was God. I was I was caught off guard. I I would I would guess that he was using that in a more sort of metaphorical way. Um talking about God as a sort of unifying principle of the universe rather right. than a everything as, ev as a, as a metaphor yeah. for everything. That's, Chapter that's what I would guess. With Pete Holmes. We talked about that. He, he's a mm -hmm. big uh, proponent of Ram Dass and okay. uh, that be here now kind of spiritual idea. And he was a former uh, deeply um, passionate Christian growing up, uh, evangelical. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, I just now recognize the word God to be kind of everything around. Yeah. Us. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Now, your third and final formative book was read a little bit later than the sort of 9, 10, 11 year period yeah. that you read the first two. And it is called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead by Tom mm -hmm. Stoppard, a play that premiered at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in 1966. I got the cover right in front of me. It's a dull gray, two sets of feet coming out of two barrels, laying on the ground. A coiled noose is hanging down from the top right. The, co the cover is in like a gold art deco kind of font, author's name in red. The New York Times says, this is a remarkable play. Very funny, very brilliant, very chilling. Tom Stoppard, born 1937 in the present day Czech Republic, alive today. He is a British playwright and screenwriter whose family fled Czechoslovakia during the Nazi regime. What's it about? Well, acclaimed as a modern dramatic masterpiece, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead is the fabulously inventive tale of Hamlet as told from the worm's eye view of the bewildered Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, two minor characters in Shakespeare's play. Uh, in Tom Stopper's best known work, the Shakespeare and Laurel and Hardy finally get a chance to take the lead role, but do so in a world where echoes of waiting for Godot resound, where reality and illusion intermix, and where fate leads our two heroes to a tragic but inevitable end. File this one under 822.914 for English dramas of the 20th century. Katie, tell us about your relationship with the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead by Tom Stopper. So I first encountered this uh, because my my sister had to had to watch the movie of it for class when she was I guess when she was in high school or something. Um, she's seven years older than me, and she was a drama major and everything. And so um, she I love so that I, she's like a drama. I love that you guys are so different. Well, yeah. So she was a drama major, and uh, she uh, spent a number of years um, as an actor, uh, just like um, doing Shakespeare and such uh, around LA. But it turned out that she was one of you know a million tall blonde actresses in LA, and it just like it's you, you, it's hard to get a break. Um, so now she's actually a math teacher. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. uh, she's great. So anyway, so she she had this this uh, play to read, this movie to watch, and I watched the film, and I was just enthralled um it was it was such an 
interesting approach to telling a story. Um, and the the main characters, at least in the film version, they go around kind of accidentally discovering uh, sort of weird things about physics. Um, and then, uh, but but like, yeah, but like with fl- the coin play flips opens and with them flipping like a coin heads ninety two times in a row. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. So so weird sort of uh, physics discussions with little geeky things uh, sort of sprinkled throughout, and um, and it it just it had they had so much fun with language. Um, and so, so I loved all the wordplay, you know, um, all of the, and it's just, it's just full of these, these really clever turns of phrase, these, these, uh, puns and, and, um, and interesting ways of speaking. And I, and I, you know, by the time I was reading this, this play, I mean, I watched the film, I read the play, um, by the time I was into this, I was also reading a bunch of Shakespeare, you know, I, I liked I liked that, and my sister, being a, a drama major, like she, you know, also helped expose me to a lot of a lot of Shakespeare. And I loved, you know, I loved Hamlet, and I loved um, the comedies and everything. And 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 this was a, it was kind of a, a take on that, but but from this this sort of weird absurdist perspective of of two minor characters. And I I um, I had I just had so much fun with it. Um, I mean, Shakespeare has some some interesting comedy. You know, there's a lot of lot of wordplay in Shakespeare, especially in the comedies. Um, but, uh, but this was just kind of taking it up a notch and, and building the entire, the entire story around that. And, uh, and I, I, I just loved it. I thought it was so much fun. I love that. I feel, I feel like there's more and more discussions today about uh, the limiting nature of language. Mm. Like I grew up just, you know, I, I was not aware of what language was, you know, growing mm. up, but I'm hearing more and more conversations that are coming into the consciousness about how limiting language is as a communications device how we're all forced to compartmentalize the vastness of our you know emotional experience into these tiny Mm -hmm. compartments called words but but you can do so much i mean there's i you could be so creative with language and you can you can create such beautiful and and thrilling things uh through through playing around with words i mean i think you know I, i mean I'm 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 obviously a scientist, but I'm also uh, I'm also somebody who just has such a love for words, for language, for for literature, for for speech, like just interesting ways of 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 playing with words to 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 get across a feeling or or a, a change of perspective, um, you know, or that that sort of that thrill of of hearing something put in just the right way or, or a new way or or a new yeah. a new perspective on on anything because of, of clever wordplay. I, I, well, I love that I, experience so much. I totally agree with you. And this is kind of the thing about narrative voice, like how astounding mm-hmm. is it that you can actually feel the author's emotional energy, yeah. even though that energy isn't directly communicated through the words. I was so shocked when my very first book came out and so many people said, I almost could tell that you're going through a divorce or a heart. it was true. Mm-hmm. I was, but mm-hmm. and I didn't talk about that at all in the word. Somehow mm-hmm. the energy Commute was communicated through the words, and you know yeah. you always hear this phrase like it's about what's re- reading between the lines. You know that that classic mm-hmm. cliche. How does that work? I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know. That's the again, we're getting into sort of human psychology, but uh, but it's 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 amazing. Like I love the idea that you can you can create an emotion in another person just by the way that you're using words, you know, um, I, I used to do a lot of, I used to like, write a lot of poetry when I was younger. And I, I loved the idea that you could, you could use words in a way to, to make someone feel something, um, it, it, it be it, you know, sadness or delight or, or amusement or, or whatever. And, and, and or I dizziness. Thought, yeah. Yeah. To quote the first line of your <laughs> wonderful poem on, yeah. on your website. Yeah. Thank I you. Want to, yeah. I want to make you feel dizzy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I love, I'll I put love a link to that poem in the show notes. So for those wondering what we're talking about, Katie has okay. an incredible poem that just Thank you. communicates the vastness of the universe on her website. And I've shared it with my community, but I'll put it in the show notes here as well. Thank you. I, yeah. ask, I was thinking about asking you to read it for us today, but oh. uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a recording online. You could just <laughs> you can play that. Okay. Um, embarrassed about it. You, you, this is absurdist, right? This play is absurdist, yeah. absurdist, absurdist. Mm-hmm. In your book, you say the universe is far more strange than we ever realized. Mm. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? I mean that that uh, yeah, it's there are things about the universe, about the largest scales and the smallest scales, uh, that are so 
that is so contradictory to our daily experience like that what? they seem absurd to us, that they, they seem impossible. Give, and... give us a few tid, tidbits on that. Well, so, so I mean, on the, on the small scales, on the quantum scales, we know that things act in very strange ways, right? We know that, that uh, um, you know, a, a particle can move through two places at once, apparently. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that a Schrodinger's particle can... cat. Yeah, the, yeah, superposition. This idea that that something is neither this or this until you until you take a measurement, uh, until you collapse the wave function. There's all these sort of weird things that happen on the small scales. Even quantum tunneling, where you can put a particle on one side of a wall and it, it'll just appear on the other side uh, eventually, um, it, without going through or, We've seen or this over happen. Or around. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. Quantum tunneling is is part is built into our technology i mean uh, you know you've ever heard of the um scanning uh, scanning tunneling microscopes uh so this is the idea of uh there are certain kinds of microscopes where the idea is they want to they want to uh hit the target with electrons very very slowly to kind of trace out the the shape of something and the, is this, the, is what this they, an electron microscope? Yeah, but yeah, but what they use as the valve to drip those electrons on is quantum tunneling. They actually create a barrier that the electrons can't get through, but occasionally they do, and that's that's how the microscope puts the electrons onto the surface. Is they they make the use make use of the quantum tunneling. They make it impossible for the the electrons to go through in a classical way, and they just quantumly appear on the other side. And that's how that's how and, they and, regulate the the flow of electrons. And I mean. We had, and, yeah, I mean, and we, so, and we don't we don't really know why that happens. I mean, it has to do uh, like we we have mathematical models for why it happens. Where uh -huh. if you if you say that every particle is not really a solid object, but a kind of wave function, a sort of a sort of cloud of probability um, in a region instead of at a single point, then it makes sense, and you can do the calculations, and you can work out the transmission probability uh, wow. based on that wave function, but okay. Okay. But it's okay. not, it's not a solid object. <laughs> and yeah. that's on the smallest scales. You gave us yeah. one tidbit and now yes. go to the, the, go to the upper edge. Okay. Uh, zoom, zoom out. I mean, we, we got as far as galaxies and with yeah. 400 billion stars in us and a nearby galaxy kind of heading towards us that'll crash into us in yeah. 4 billion years. But yeah. You know, zoom out to the highest possible level. Yeah. I'd, lo I'd love a, a I've been at, waiting to ask it. I would love a, a metaphor for how me walking down the street can think of the size of the universe. I, oh, I'm gosh. Just, I'm yeah. Just, I'm struggling for one of these physical metaphors, and I figure, feel like you have one, like a grain of sand. And no, a I, mean, of whatever. I mean, there's, you know, I. <laughs> You can you can come up with you can come up with lots of things like that, but none of them mean anything. I mean, I mean, to your own experience, you know, you can give you can talk about, you know, how many how many school buses you'd have to line up between here and the moon in order to, you know, yeah. to cover the distance. But it doesn't you know, at some point your brain how is just we, like, oh, that's a lot. Possibly contemplate yeah. the size. No, I'm asking you, though, seriously, how, how do yeah. we think about the size of the thing? I mean, I don't I don't I don't try to I don't try to envision it all in my head. I, I use uh, I mean, I do what other scientists do. We use uh we use scientific notation, right? So, so ten to the one is is ten. Ten to the two is a hundred. Ten to right. the three is a thousand. And so, you know, I I deal with things that are on the scale of ten to the eighteen meters. I mean, this is like that's that's just too huge a distance to contemplate to to really hold in your head. You can you can try to kind of zoom out in in uh, powers of ten. You know, so there's oh, that's there's, even there's that's famous... even just the observable universe. Yeah, yeah, that's just the observable. So, so there's unobservable after that potentially. And then potentially. what's after what's after that? What's I mean, outside? we don't know. We don't know. We we have no information about anything beyond the observable universe. Okay, so, well, give me something strange about okay. about the about the big universe, okay. and then I, yeah. so so here's my favorite one, and it's it's freaky. Okay, so so you know how if if something is far away, it looks smaller, right? Yeah. Like so, just you know. I'm with you so far. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you had a galaxy, if you if you uh, if you have a, a galaxy of a particular size, right? Just a normal size galaxy. There's some physical say scale of that galaxy. If it is, uh, if you if it's farther away, it looks smaller, up to a point, and beyond that point, if it's farther away, it looks bigger. And well, the reason for that, <laughs> the reason for that is that the universe is expanding, which means that it was much much smaller in the past. And the most distant things we see right now are the things that are so far away that their light has taken billions and billions of years to reach us. And so there are some things that we can see that are so far away that the light has taken so long to reach us that when the light left those things, they were actually very close to us because the universe was smaller. And then the universe expanded and now they're very far away, but the light from them is coming to us from a closer point. 
And so that means that they look bigger on the sky because they actually were taking up more of the sky because they were closer when the light left them. But if they were, then why are, are they now? Well, now, well, now they're really far away because the universe has expanded since the light uh, left them, and the and the expansion of the universe carried them away from us. So I'm 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 not following. It's something that so it's it's everything further away from us looks smaller and smaller up to a point, and then it looks bigger. Yes, because the light left it so long ago that it was from a point in the universe when the universe was constricted, like the universe was you know fit into a thimble or whatever. Because yeah, the universe was a lot smaller. So, but it was a lot smaller. It's not a lot smaller now. So why? No, is it but bigger? but so it's like okay. So imagine, imagine that no, um, I'm not challenging you. I want to make that clear. No, I just no, don't understand. No, no, no. It's 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 extreme. <laughs> this is this is the point. It's extremely counterintuitive. It's very hard to understand. Um, imagine that uh, that um, I don't know. I um, I shout something to you and then I run away. Okay. Um, and let's say I run extraordinarily fast, whatever, uh, you will hear what I said to you. It'll be loud because I was close to you when I said it. But by the time you hear it, I'm very, very far away. And if I shouted from there, you wouldn't be able to hear it because it was it would be too quiet. Right. Um, so so and somebody else, um, you know, they they are far away and they, you know, they shout to you and then they move a little bit farther away, but they haven't moved very much farther away. And they, you know, whether you hear from them is a little bit quieter than what you heard from me, because when I shouted at you, I was very, very close. And then I ran away very quickly. Um, when the light, when, when the universe was smaller, a galaxy, you know, the light left some galaxy and then the universe expanded and that galaxy is really, really far away from us now. But that light has been traveling to us since that time. And the, the amount of sky that that image took up when the light left it is the amount of sky that the image takes up when we see it. Wow, but the the galaxy is really far away. But a a, a galaxy that's um, you know, that's, I I, that's, I think I kind of yeah. get it now. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's really like you'd have to draw diagrams. It's really hard to explain. Even I taught a general relativity class um, last last semester um, when I was still at NC State and. And I, I was explaining this to my students and I was drawing the diagrams and they, and it was the end of the semester. They'd already learned all of general relativity and they're still looking at me like, what are you saying? <laughs> like, it's really counterintuitive. Well, this really is part, of what, to, this to is part of what you have a, an amazing gift of, right? You are taking the vastness of the cosmos that we all stare into and wonder about and the extra steps of knowledge you have, your trends relating them back for us and it's so appreciated maybe to close this conversation mm -hmm. off which has been a real gift i really thank you. mean that like it's thank you um you scratching the itch inside us all that we have been to our soul to wonder and know more about where we are and what this thing even is H how may we I'll, I'll ask you for take a pause and close us off with how might we go through our life with a little bit more cosmological awareness um, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think that, I think that what we can do is, I think that a lot of, a lot of people think about physics and astronomy and mathematics and think that's for science people. I'm not a science person. I don't understand that stuff. Right. Um, and people think, oh, I'm not smart enough for that. I don't know. And I think that that's wrong. I think that there is there are things that we can all understand and appreciate about the universe. We can all uh, look into the night sky and wonder, and we can all uh, try to try to get some glimpse of of this beautiful universe we live in. And there are people, you know, like me, who are out there working to make this stuff accessible. And I think that one thing we can do, uh, those of us who are not scientists, one thing we can do is to you know, to to actually trust that 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 we do have the capacity to understand some things about the universe, and to you know to think about it, and to contemplate it, and to to seek out sources who will walk us through these very difficult questions and give us some some of that insight. Not everybody is going to talk down to you. Not everybody is going to uh, you know be uh, you know, uh, condescending because they understand things that you don't understand. There are people out there who who just want to share understanding and love of the universe. And 
if if you can find those people, if you can find those sources, then you can have that experience of of understanding something new and, and learning something about the universe. And it's such an amazing experience to have. And I experience that every day in my work. I learn something new about the universe and I, I it's it's a wonderful thing. And I think that we should all have that um, have that experience. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. On page 181 of your book, you say, we don't know how to, how to connect dark matter or dark energy, which constitute 95% of the universe to fundamental physics. So in that sense, we don't understand anything at all. We don't know how far it goes. We don't know what's past observable and we don't know what's outside of it, Mm -hmm. but you have given us a little bit of light in the darkness today. Thank you so much for coming on three books and thank you so much for the gift of your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation.